Please subscribe to his YouTube <laughs> channel. New episodes every week. You want to dance with Dom? This isn't working. Like, I'm just not feeling it today. Like, you're a dumb guy, right? Yo, this guy is like actually a racist. Like, you fing loser. How know. much can Dom Mazzetti bench? Probably 275 for three. How much do you lift? Probably 275 for three. Uh, Mike, dude, yeah. I want to hear about Dom. It is me. Like, yeah. it's still me. It's Dom! Yeah. It's Dom! <laughs> you loser. Say what? All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Don't Be Sour, episode number 34 with none other than, well, I thought I was going to have Dom Mazzetti on here, but we got uh, Mike Tornabeni. Tornabeni, I said it, it right? You it, well, actually, yeah. on, I had, those are my, my Dom f***ing notes. I have to go back to my mic notes, dude. This is, there we go. You can, have, right. you can have questions for both. Like, <laughs> I can go in and out of character, whatever you want. It's you like know? you walk in, I'm like, yeah. dude, who the f*** is this guy? I was expecting the bandana and everything, man. Dude, it's funny. I've actually done the opposite. I've been on uh, JK News and they were you know, expecting me to come out of character. And I came in character and did the whole thing like in character. And they, they loved it. But they were like, I was not prepared for this. Do people ever request like which version they like, if you're like, we want you to come be at this event, but not not your real not Mike. No, because I usually decide like for that. I was like, this is humor. So I'm going to come in character and like just be humorous the whole time. And then they're like, all right, let's do this one out of character so you can get more like actual insight, like your insight into something instead of just like making jokes. Um, but usually like if I do a podcast, I'm just going to come normally <laughs> and then I can be like, Hey, the options, if you want an answer from Dom, you can, you know, be like, switch it, it up. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, it's a dance monkey situation. Like I'd like you to be funny now. So yeah. turn into Dom for me now. <laughs> exactly. This mic is getting fucking lame. It's like that in my head too. I'm like, all right, time to be funny. Time to be serious. Time, and it's, you know, helps uh, well, separate. Dude, w welcome to the show. And just so if in case people do not know, who this icon of a man is in the fitness sphere. Who are you, dude? What do you do? Uh, my name is Don Mazzetti, uh, AKA the professor. And I've been doing YouTube for 12 years. Started Don Mazzetti verse channel doing comedy skits. And then actually December, 2012, so 10 years ago, started bro science, bro science life on YouTube. And I make uh, gym satire videos, making fun of gym culture and bros in general. Dude, I, I have been personally watching you for a very long time. Like before I've been on YouTube for 10 years as of this month. Nice. A whole decade of making stupid vlogs, right? Yeah. Much different content than what you make. But I I remember literally being in my I call it my trap house days with just like, you know, you and four of your boys and you're mm -hmm. paying two hundred for rent in this like shitty place. Like we were watching your Dom videos back then, like every single time you would upload. It was like we'd all sit around, put it on the fucking TV, be like, you want to dance with Dom? <laughs> and it's like uh, updating my Facebook, uh, drunk, going to get some Chipotle. Dude, that's funny because I, <laughs> I was filming that in my own personal trap house. <laughs> really? Dude. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was like my first New York City apartment with my buddy Gion, and it was an absolute shit pit, man. And we filmed on a, a camera, like a mini DV like film uh, like video camera that I got when I was freshman in high school to like film skate videos and I still had the camera and couldn't afford another one so we were just filming it on like tape it, it was life was easier back in that those days yeah. when it was like there was no adjusting the lighting it was like just turn it on press record that's it it Get, was it was a lot more difficult to edit but easier just to be like yeah this is supposed to be shitty yeah yeah does it ever so I, you know I'm I, the whole Mike and Dom thing yeah. does it ever get annoying of people like having this like alternate personality um no I mean I think like in the beginning when like no one knew who I was outside of the character. Like they didn't know my real name. Like I didn't have a personal Instagram. Like I didn't have a personal YouTube channel. And I just like kept it really private because I just didn't really care. Like I wanted, this is the character. I don't want to interrupt that. So people would meet me and I was also younger and my fan base is younger. So it's some kind, sometimes come up and be like super bro -y and expect me to be like really, really bro -y back. Sometimes they'd be kind of like assholes and expect yeah. me to be an asshole. I'm like, look, you're a stranger, man. I'm just going to be nice to you and like, talk to you and that kind of phased out as people realized like I'm a real person and people started to realize like you know follow my personal stuff or my Instagram or my other YouTube channel and I think as we all just got older yeah <laughs> like, kind of grew out of that a bit but it's cool man I mean a lot of people are just like they get it now they they realize that this it's a character do you, do you know who Rain Wilson is if I say the name yeah so who, who is it for the people who don't it's, know who Rain Wilson is uh Dwight from the office yeah, yeah exactly and I feel like do you ever have the problem of I think he's talked about it. And I think like George from uh, Seinfeld, Seinfeld yeah. has the thing of like, once you do this character for so long, like when Rain Wilson walks down the street, people are probably like, 
Dwight. Yeah. Dwight. Do people call you Dom or they don't even know like your name? Uh, it's a mix now. Like, like I said earlier, Dom exclusively. And they're surprised to hear my name is Mike. Now more people know. Like it's it's more people have learned about me. I've been doing different things out of character. So it's a mix. It's um, mostly like people be like, yo, Dom or your bro science. Because it's like then I kind of know they're like. Uh, what type of fan they are. (laughs) If they call me Mike, I know that they're like really involved and they follow all my stuff and they they get it. So it's a, it's a mix of both. Okay. And why why don't like, before we dive, I, is it, first of all, is it like frustrating that like whenever people talk to you, they're just like, tell me about Dom. Tell me about Dom Mazzetti. Fuck Uh, Mike, dude. I want to hear about Dom. I mean, I've had my own sort of, uh, identity crisis with this back in like 2016 <laughs> is dom cooler than me no, should dude, i just switch personally I, honestly that, that's a whole that was a whole thing man i was like living in the shadow of my own creation <laughs> and, and like now i'm fine with it because i'm like it is me like it's yeah. still me it's it, it's in my head i'm still that guy it's just like i i just switch back and forth to it but um sometimes it can it can get a little weird just being like it it outwardly it's a, a totally different person yeah like, it's still those, those thoughts and those like um, the creativity and the humor is all obviously still coming from me. But um, when people are just like not sure what to, the, the disparity between the two is. is, is it's like they meet yeah. you and they're maybe slightly disappointed when you talk to them like, hey man, I appreciate it a yeah, lot. They're, they're like, like, oh, yeah. and they're like, duh, it's <laughs> dumb. They're like, yeah, there you are. <laughs> yeah. They're like, they don't know what their wires all across, <laughs> they don't have to do. So a little bit, like it, it was definitely a thing I had to like adjust to with, um, as it got bigger and as I was like, I didn't want to pigeonhole myself as just this character. And I started having like, I said like an identity crisis of being like, am I interesting outside of it? Yeah. And now it's like, I've, I've done some other things and I've kind of like found other things that I, um, you know, like to see is my value entertainment wise or personality wise that I'm focusing more on. But also I don't see it as like, I'm at odds with the character as much anymore where I'm like, you know, is, am I as interesting as this? Like, no, it's still me. Like, yeah. it, it was a weird sort of uh, dichotomy before. And now it's much more like, I kind of understand it like personally and more okay with well, it. I feel like people they meet, like you know, whether they expect the Dom character or the Mike, but then they meet you. I mean, you, you're a cool fucking dude. You like, you, you look cool. You fucking talk cool. You got Thanks, cool man. tattoos and you got a cool character. Yeah. You have like the, 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 the full package there, man. Appreciate it. I mean, it's all part of the process. Though. I mean, cause it was like kind of, you know, we were joking earlier about finding yourself and like, I kind of had to, I was like, I created this, this character that kind of just got away from me. It was just like blew up. And I was like, I'm really nothing like this in, in a lot of ways. Like, yeah, I, I love bro stuff. I love partying. I love going to the gym. Like I make the same type of jokes, like the same type of humor, but like, I'm also very different in real life. And it was hard for me to kind of like, come out of my shell and be like, this is who I really am. Cause I didn't a want to affect the perception of the character yeah, and like break that wall and B I was just didn't want to open myself up to that judgment. Cause I was in this like safe zone of like, this is comedy and this is like a buffer between my real self and like the world. So I can just kind of like do say and be whatever and know that like, it doesn't reflect on me personally. Right. But then I'm like, all right, like I want to be myself more, but now I got to like put that out in the world and like, who am I really? So I had to kind of like that's discover an, that. That's an identity crisis. Yeah, I'm dude. telling you, man, it was real. You, it's, it's like this thing of like, you're just looking yourself in the mirror and just like, who am I? And it's like, there's a guy with a headband looking back. <laughs> like, fuck you, loser. <laughs> He's right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, dude, why don't we like go back a little bit and like, tell me about like you in your upbringing and kind of like, not necessarily how you like st- got to be Dom, but like, who is Mike and... Like, how did you start even getting on social media? What were you like as a kid? Like, what did you do before yeah. you turned into this character? All right, we're going back. Um, I, I trace it all back to skateboarding. So that was the first thing that I did when I was, that I really like fell in love with. I was probably 13 years old. And you're 34, you said, right? Yeah. So in high school, that's all I did. I got into skateboarding and- yeah, He's going to bring this mic up, man. Yeah, just keep drooping down. A lot of guys have that problem, you know. <laughs> Do you have any uh, Mike Viagra right here? Technical difficulties, get, ladies and gentlemen. You just hold them. <laughs> just, yeah. just like that's because then you could just flex. That's the your whole first time. instinct yeah. of how I would hold a mic. <laughs> I've never done this before. I mean, podcast. <laughs> All right, dude. Yeah. So take us back to the origin of Mike. 
Yeah. So uh, skateboarding is where I kind of trace it all back to. I started skating in high school and I just, it's all I did. And when you start skating, you like make skate videos. And so uh, I had mentioned that I had got this camera for my birthday freshman year and I would film all these skate videos on it and then I would edit them and just spend hours doing that. that A camcorder. A camcorder. Yeah. Mini DV camcorder. (laughs) Yeah. Little tiny tapes and you had to like rewind it to the spot and all this. Yeah. So it, it was tragic really it was was a lot of work but i fell in love with you know skateboarding first and then video making and um i guess i always had a i don't know a a knack for comedy just growing up a sarcastic kid in new jersey like people are funny out there man they make them funny um and i had a, a friend that uh since second grade that i used to skate with uh his name's Gion, and we always had like a good comedic chemistry and we would film like little sketches together and little bits outside of skateboarding. And throughout high school, as I was just doing more of that, it was like the only things I would do would skateboard and then film and edit and make little like videos. I was like, Oh, what do I want to do with my life? And I'm like, Oh, I want to, I want to make films. I want to, you know, be a writer. I want to be a comedy writer. I want to go to film school. I just kind of decided that I didn't want to do anything else. At first I thought when I was younger, I wanted to be an architect and I was like, I'm terrible at math. (laughs) I'm not going to, my do bridges this. would collapse. Yeah, This is, this is a bad idea. It's like, what? Cause I like to draw Like, no, I'm not, it's not going to happen. So I just picked this and, uh, yeah. So I, I, I want to pause on the yeah. skateboard real fast. Yeah. I'm kind of a skateboard fanatic in myself. No way. I want to deep dive into your skateboarding history. Let's do it. How, how, how like deep are you when, were you in the skating community? Cause we're like the same age. Yeah. Were you on like skate perception? Like the website? No. Do you know what that is? No. Damn. That was like the, the skateboarding forum. Like it'd be like the bodybuilding.com of skateboarding back then. It's like where everyone would upload their clips. So it was like a, a forum where skaters would put up, would put up their videos. We didn't, when I was skating, there, there, there wasn't really like an internet component to it. Like <laughs> you're it was, only one year older than me. But like, like the when, internet but, didn't exist. But when did you skate? When did you, were you skating at the same time as me though? I would, yeah, it's a, yeah. you know, 14 to 18. I think there's like a two year gap in there uh. though that like it's where the internet became more of a thing. Like, Cause I remember the only access I had to any skate content was like magazines. I would subscribe to CCS magazines yeah, exactly. and shit. Uh, videos I would have to buy like VHS videos or things I would download off LimeWire. There wasn't really like, as far as I knew, like a lot of websites that I can access. Maybe there were existing at the time, but the internet was so new yeah. that I didn't know how to like get around it. What, what's yeah. your, what's your favorite skate video? Oh, uh, sorry. Okay. Flip, sorry. Yeah. See, I, th- I think the girl, yeah, right. Yeah. It was, and as a filmmaker, you know, they, they hired, who was it? Like Spike Jones or yeah. something that did like the green screen yeah. skateboard and yep. shit. And when they tossed a board and it went into like another scene, it was incredible. Yeah. Revolutionary shit. Yeah. That, I mean, as a, as a skate video, that's like arguably one of the best ever made. Yeah. I was just like more of a, like a flip guy, more of like a Hessian sort of. And, and you're, you're like underplaying. You're very good at skateboarding. I didn't know. I didn't know until I was started doing deep dive. I was like, this guy fucking shreds. Yeah, I picked it up back, uh, last year. I took 15 years off, and then I, I picked it up last year. I want to get back. I, as, as someone who's yeah. older, is it, like, I can do all the similar tricks that I did back in the day. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm, I'm more worried about, like, my falls are a lot harder these days than back then. So there's a lot that goes into it, right? Like, like I said, I, I was really good in high school. Took, just stopped, and I started working out because I didn't want to get hurt. I didn't want to get hurt and not be big, which is a whole other thing that, like, you know, uh, we won't get into, but like it, when I picked it back up, I was 30, yeah, 33. And I was like, all right, it's kind of coming back sort of quick. Like I could still do like the flat ground stuff. And then as soon as I like did my first crooked grind, I was like, oh, I still have it. Like I can still skate. It's not just like tooling around. Are you chucking yourself down like 10 stairs these days? I'm, get, I'm getting there. <laughs> Shit, I'm, I'm trying to, but like that's, there's a weird thing when you come back into skating where like you, you still have the muscle memory in there. You, you know, you can do certain tricks, but your consistency is all over the place. Yeah. So you're like, when you first start skating, everything is gradual, right? Like you start with a curb and then a higher ledge and then a rail and then these things like, but now when you start again, you can do the bigger stuff, but your consistency is so off that you might land it first try, or you might eat absolute shit every other time. And your falls are also worse because you're bigger yeah. and you're not used to it. So there's a lot of damage you take in the beginning. And there's a lot of like psychological components to get over where you're like, I know I can do this trick and I can land it right now. So I'm just going to try it. But you haven't worked back up to it. So 
chances are you like you're gonna eat shit at some point. Well, the, the problem is now you go to like a skate park. You're like, I want to get back into it. I want to practice. And you go and there's a bunch of 12 year olds that are doing, you know, switch fucking oh, yeah. and stuff. And like, you know, d down the, the, the rails and everything. And you're like, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to practice my kickflip real fast. Yeah. And then you fail and you're like, fuck, these kids are like so much better than I am. Yeah. And, you know, I was uh, I was showing my brother you and because it's funny when people who don't know about skateboarding, I was like, damn, Mike's like really good at this. And he's like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah. And I was trying to like create an analogy. Right. And in your recent video, you like pop a tray flip immediately and then you do like a back tail slide or something. And I was trying to explain, I was like, I, the 360 flip, if you were to compare it to the gym, is the 315 bench. That's like a really good analogy. That, the yeah. kick flip is like 225. Like, right. okay, most yeah. people can probably right. do that. Like the tray flip to do it flawlessly and to do it like without like, holy shit, I landed one, yeah. would be the, yeah, I can just hit 315 casually. Yeah. You're yeah. really good, man. And it's, it's, it's sick. And I'm like, it's cool seeing you get back into it. It's definitely something that I want to get back. Like it's like a do passion it. that I had back yeah. then. But I'm just now I'm just worried about embarrassing myself in front of eight year olds. No, nah, man. I mean, like that's I I hate not being good at things. Yeah. And I hate being new to it. And I had to get over that. And like, if I can do that, you certainly can. And it's like I I highly recommend it. I mean, I'm so glad I got back into it. I'm annoyed that I took so many, so many years off. Uh, but it does. It takes a little bit. And you just like you find a go to a park early, man. Like that's what I would do. I would go to the park <laughs> before the kids are out of exactly. school. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, even even 8 a.m., 9, 10, like nobody's there. And yeah. you can just kind of find a park that, you know, has the things that you like to skate and just gradually get better. And it, it comes back pretty quick and then you just keep doing it. And for me now it's part of like my fitness regimen, like it's cardio keeps me in shape. It also just like gives me something other than the gym to like add and to, you know, my interests and my personality and, and my fitness where it's like, I can relieve some of the pressure of lifting as my only source of like looking a certain way and getting my, you know, getting in shape when I know I'm doing like two hours of skating a day, plus like lifting every day. So now when I'm, I do all these like deadlifts and shit. Now when yeah. I'm like skating, I'm like, fuck my back hurts. I'm like, like <laughs> yeah. you're just, just skating. And I'm like, I'm not even doing anything. It's different muscles, man. Like my back hurt like hell when I first started. And then you just kind of like, you get used to it. And you just remember like, you're coming from a, a different thing. Like lifting is such a kind of like rigid, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and skating, you've got to be loose. And you know, you're, your uh, your weight distribution is all over the place now. I mean, I was 130 when I was skating. Yeah. Like 50 fucking pounds heavier. And I'm like, I hit the ground a lot harder and I'm a lot top heavier. So it's just like my balance is all. all well, with place. skating, it also comes down to, I was, again, explaining my brother. I was trying to like explain to someone who has no idea about skateboarding. And it, I was like, oh, you can do a 360 flip. He's like, is that good? I was like, yep. Yeah. But it's not just that he can do a 360 flip. It's that he can do it without like it looking like it's very difficult for him to do. I was like, right. that's, there's a difference of doing a trick and then doing it and making it look so effortlessly. Yeah. And that's like where the the cool factor comes in and like truly see like how someone is so good. So it's just a little side tangent, but super cool to see you like cool, being yeah. skating because I still catch myself watching skate videos once or twice a month. Yeah. Because I think it's the most interesting sport in the world to watch. It's the coolest. Man. I think it's the most technical. I'm like the yeah. fact that people can flip this shit and catch it, go down, you know, 30 stairs and now again there's like 10 year olds yeah. i watched a video of this like kid that they brought uh from overseas this little asian kid who literally was had been 12 and i'm like they're insane insane yeah, like, like and they, they can throw themselves down 30 stairs because they've started when <laughs> yeah right when, when they were like months old yeah you know like we started skating at 13 you know what i mean like that's like the normal time for people to skate and now it's like they've done it since they were kids and this is why the progression is so insane. It's like by the time they're 13, they're 13 years, like some yeah. of them 13 years into skating, which is like, and then they got another like 20 to go. Like yeah. gonna, uh, it's, it's absolutely wild. The progression. of it. Well, it's cool to see you get back into it. And so, so that was the thing that led you to get into like creating yep. videos. And then how did, how did you like get to the point where, cause you're one of the true OGs on you're in the first realm of YouTube. Like, yeah. you know, it's not like you were on like day one, but you were in the first kind of like generation of it. How did you get to doing social media? And was the whole Dom Mazzetti thing, was that your first attempt at, I'm going to make videos for the internet? So, um, back, it, I was uh, alluding to the relationship me and my, my buddy Gion had, and we had a, like a comedic chemistry. So in high school, we were like, oh, like, we're, we, we're good at this. We Let's do some, you know, comedy stuff. We started working at a restaurant together and we're like, this would be a great idea for a TV show. 
And I ended up going to film school. I went to NYU uh, film and television. So I knew I wanted to be a comedy writer. I, that's, that was my goal. Write scripts, write, uh, make a TV show, sell it. Like that's what I wanted to do since day one of, of college. And so me and my buddy Guillaume were working on a pilot for that. And <clears throat> all throughout college, we would just write different scripts and different things to try to like break into the industry. Like I would do my classes and stuff and we'd go home and FaceTime and write and just trying anything we could to like get into traditional Hollywood as writers. And like, cause I didn't really want to be an actor. I didn't want to make, I didn't want to do stand up. And why is that? Uh, I just didn't, wasn't really interesting to me. It was it, just like, it wasn't like you, it was it, you didn't want to be on the, like facing the camera. You want to be behind the, behind the camera. It wasn't that I didn't want to be, it's just, it wasn't my focus, right? Like my focus was like, I just want to write humor. And like, if I act in it, cool, but I don't want to just like pursue an, an acting career. Like I didn't really want to act in other people's stuff that I didn't write. And I just figured like the main focus for me was just to write a uh, script, write comedy, be like a, a screenwriter. And so we would do that for all of college. And then around 2009, so uh, junior year, meeting in a senior year, we started making sketches like on YouTube just to get our name out there. At the time, like no one was making, you know, videos on YouTube really. It was yeah. like, what, like one guy, Fred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fred, <laughs> Kev, Jumba, yeah. Philip yeah, DeFranco. Exactly. Like, so there was just like a few Cass people, and, and then random like viral like silly videos. And so we, um, we started making sketches to get our name out there, not thinking of like, oh, I'm gonna be a YouTuber because at the time, like, in our heads, it had even like a weird connotation. We're like, I don't really want to be a YouTuber. It was, yeah, it was kind of strange. But we saw people who would like have viral sketches and then end up on SNL, right, or some shit like that. So we're like, let's just start doing this in conjunction with writing our screenplays. And, you know, we would film it on, on the camera and just make these random sketches. And they were funny, but nobody was really watching them. And we, uh, the, the internet was such a different place then. We, like, Instagram didn't exist. Um, Facebook was just profiles, no timeline. Yeah. And so we had like a joint comedy profile. And that was like our, one of our first like social media things. And what we would do with that profile is we would ma make a video on YouTube and manually post it to everybody's wall because there was uh, no timeline. So we couldn't just- wall? I haven't heard yeah, like- exactly. post I forgot that that's what it's called, yeah. posting on someone's wall. So there wasn't like <laughs> a, a, a shared place for like things to be like seen by everybody. So we had to manually post it to people's walls and we were doing that for a while. And um, then we graduated and did a bunch of odd jobs to make ends meet and make some money to move back to the city. And we're still doing that whole thing. Like This is in Jersey. Yeah, uh, yeah, we did the odd jobs in Jersey because um, I was I went to NYU, so we were doing all that in the city. Moved back to Jersey for a summer, did a bunch of odd jobs, got some money, moved back to the city, uh, got a shitty apartment Upper East Side, and um, we're filming sketches, writing screenplays. We were like cold calling people and like we had this like pranks. No, we had this encyclopedia of like numbers in, of people in Hollywood, and we were just calling everybody and just trying to pitch these scripts and these ideas to people. So, so how, yeah. how would that go? You call like a random director? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And we would call like, I remember we talked to like some producers at like the food network and we're trying to pitch them some like comedy uh, pilot about a restaurant. And like, I don't know, we're just trying to get traction any way we could. How do you cold call someone of that like caliber? Cause they're like, I don't, who we, are you? Dude, we were hungry, man. I'm a guy. I, <laughs> yeah. I got some good shit. You don't know me, but I got some yeah. good shit. I don't, I don't really remember too much of like how, like the, how the conversations went, but like, you know, we had some people that were like, at least pretended to be interested. But yeah. Yeah. We were just trying anything, man. Like, so, and one of those, any things was uh, making YouTube videos and we did it probably for a year before anyone really started like watching. And the first thing that people started watching was, uh, the first Domizetti video we did, which was called Domizetti versus Terrorism. So it was a good topic to go in on. It was, like a, it was like a bomb scare that happened recently. And I was like making jokes about like how everything is so ambiguous and like who, who are the guys taking care of this? Like they don't know anything. Yeah. And so like, let's set up this interview with this, you know, character that I kind of like did. It was this, uh, you know, it was the accent and this like personality that me and my friends from Jersey would do. It's like, you know, something dumb would happen and you would kind of talk in the Dom accent. And then I, had also written like a, a script about it in, in college. It was like a middle-aged Guido with a cooking show. So I was like, I had this character that existed in a different way. And I'm like, oh, let's bring this to this sketch. And Gion would, interviewed me as like a bomb squad agent. And I just like sat the camera up for like an hour and a half and just like riffed and interviewed 
how this idiot would take care yeah. of a bomb scare. And uh, I then cut it all together and it was like all these jump cuts into like this minute long thing. And we started posting that to people's uh, walls on, on Facebook and people were like, oh, this is hilarious. And it was like the first thing that got like a thousand views, right? We're like, oh, we're on to something here. And then the next video was Dom is Eddie versus Four Loco. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. So that one, you're like, all right, same thing again. Four Loco, super popular. Everybody was talking about how like they would get blacked out and do all this wild shit. And it was, was like, the best, honestly. Yeah, it that was crazy. sparks yeah. and shit. Uh, the sparks are <laughs> wild too. And so like this is when it still had caffeine in it. And so we made this video, basically the same thing where like Gion was interviewing Dom, me, um, talking about his wild night on Four Loco. And again, set the camera up, like shot for like two hours of me just like riffing, answering questions. Two hours for like a one minute yeah, we, short. We, we boil it down to like two minutes. It was probably like anywhere between 45 minutes and two hours. We would shoot. Do you have the un, the uncuts originals? <sighs> yes. Yeah, I have the tapes because they're shot on mini DV tapes, which made it even like harder. We had to like go through. You have the mini DV somewhere? Yeah. Oh shit. I yeah. wish I had all my skate videos. I was, I they're, don't. They're there. They're on the thing. Yeah. I have all that. Yeah. You need to release these like the. Yeah, that's a good idea. The, un, the unseen. Yeah. The well, director's cut. Well, there was some point. Like, unfortunately, we did have to tape over some stuff because we couldn't afford to buy new tapes. So we just had to keep people don't know the struggles of like <laughs> memory cards. Now you're like, <laughs> you're like, fuck, I, I taped over my my, yeah, my kick exactly. flip down the two exactly. stair. Yeah. So I had to tape over some stuff. But um, yeah, so then we did that that interview and it was just like improv the, this night and cut it together into this hilarious story. And we did the same thing, posted to people's walls on Facebook. And we we were able to see there's this feature, I guess, if you look up a certain thing like a Don Mazzetti, right? Or Four Loco. You could see who shared it. And we started to see people we didn't know sharing it between each other. We're like, oh shit, like it's, it's going viral. Like yeah. super slowly. It was like a thousand views, 10,000 views. A month later, a hundred thousand, 200, 300. And so we're like, oh shit, like we we're doing it. Like we're making it a viral video. It's like going slowly. It's like, all right, another one, another one. So we did like four videos and uh, they all, we're doing like really well. We had this, you know, channel that was um, Mike and Gion, and those four Damazetti videos lived on there. And then um, Mike and Gion was the elephant. Yeah, yeah, logo. The elephant in the room. Yeah, the M and G thing. Um, and then we we knew a guy through Gion's friend who started what came to be full screen, the MCN. Yeah. Um, he was his name was George, and he he had just started full screen. It was I think called like cute things exploding. Nobody was on it. And he was like, so here, like talking to us, like you guys can actually get paid by making videos. You're like, what? <laughs> like, okay, wow. So this is a career. Um, Mom. Yeah. Hey, I'm doing it. I'm making money. Hey, you see me? Look at me now. But uh, so he was like, yeah, you, you become a YouTube partner and you get ads run and you get, you know, a cut of that. And to become a YouTube partner, you know, you can sign with our, our network. And, and we're only going to take 80% of your revenue. Hey, they, they, <laughs> they, they only took 20, which was super low for an MCN. Yeah. But it was like, because we were like one of the first people and, um, and yeah, he signed us up and, and he was like, but here's what you got to do. You got to start over. I was like, what? He's like, you got to make another channel and call it Dom is Eddie. Cause it, it right. Dom is Eddie verse. Cause this is like, it's, it's way better to be more focused than have a channel. That's just kind of like random sketches. It's crazy. Cause I mean, back then they're like, it, it's crazy that someone had like a strategy for it when back then everyone was just throwing shit against the wall. Right. But there I was, mean, it, I guess the guy knew cause he made full screen, which is like one of the major yeah. MCNs. But so we're like, you kidding me? Like we just worked for five years before we saw any success. Like we tried everything and now we finally got it. You're saying like, we got to do it again. Like just start from scratch. It's like, all right, fine. So we left the videos up on the original channel, re uploaded the first four to the new Damazetti verse channel and just started over and our plan was as soon as they eclipsed the old views that we would remove them from the first channel and eventually they did I, some they were just i guess popular yeah. and we continued to make new ones in the new channel so eventually we did we just started over and did it again and that's that was the first youtube channel did you get inspiration from um like my new haircut and shit do you know that guy yeah yeah, so See like, his fucking haircut. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like. I wouldn't say so much. I got inspiration from it. That was around yeah. the same time, right? Right. I got inspiration from the idea. It's like people are doing funny sketches yeah. on on um, YouTube. Anyone from Jersey acted like, like acts that. Like yeah, that. That, so it's like that's that was like our. That's how we kind of talk to each other yeah. when you're like being dumb or playing this like character with your friends. You know, it was just sort of this persona you would do. So like, it was great. It was fucking hilarious. And so I think like 
videos like that inspired a lot of people to start making their own. And so that's what we were doing. We were seeing people like a, a few success stories of like, hey, these people got some views on it. We can do that. But we also like can do more. Like we're screenwriters. Like we write comedy. Like I, I went to film school. This is what I want to do. Instead of just like, I'm going to be a one hit wonder of you know a viral video. Like I'm going to use this as a launching pad for my Hollywood career. And so that's, that was the goal even when we started, you know, going really viral and making money on YouTube. How, uh, why did you name it Don Mazzetti? That was a, a, a name from a prank phone call me and a friend did. Just, Say what? Yeah, we were just, Don Mazzetti was the name. That's just like a name yeah. you put on your ass? Yeah, just pulled it out. Was there a, an alternate name that you almost decided on? Nope. It was just, that was the one. And why, why with you and Gion, why were you the guy in front of the camera? Was that a, a, a it, it just was the way it was. I mean, because of the character, um, you know, I, it was sort of like my character in my head. I mean, I wrote, I had written a script with the character like probably two years prior to this. Um, also, I'm the Italian one and he's Indian. So mm. <laughs> it seemed to work a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that was, that's just how it, it went. Um, and, you know, he's, he was great at doing um, the interview and the feedback and like the straight guy and, Mix. It would always be funny because you would do a lot of the videos where your friend would, you know, be behind the camera, just ask the questions. Yeah. And then there was a lot where he was in the scene with you. Yeah. And I remembered seeing all the comments were like, how is he keeping like a straight face? So fun, man. Because like we would crack up, like, you know, we would have to do some things over. But he, he was great, man. It was like having that that dynamic was so funny, just like us next to each other physically and just like his super calm sarcastic demeanor and then this like over the top character yeah and the idea that like why are these two friends and it's like he's forcing him to do this and it just became a great great uh, it's mix. interesting to hear like that you know this we'll call it like a dumb character like you're playing right. a dumb guy right yeah. um that there's so much like structure behind the scenes like i always thought it was just like i'm sure he just like was like oh i got a fuck like a good idea i'm gonna sit down and say some random things off yeah. the top of my dome but like you were kind of like scripting it out did you ever like as you're writing it and as you're saying the scene, be like, no, 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 I got something funnier. I got something funnier. Yeah. So in, in the beginning, it was, we would come up with ideas of what we want to talk about. Like the four local thing. I was like, I would see what's going on around me and I'd be like, here's what's funny about it. Everybody talking like really hyperbolically about their, their stories of, of yeah. four loco. And it just, it was all the same. They would black out and do something that's like, I got blacked out for four dollars. Yeah, like mildly <laughs> dumb, and I was just like, I got to make fun of these people because yeah. they sound ridiculous. Everyone had a story about how they blacked out, so I was like, let's you know poke fun at these certain things, and we sort of have like at later as we we did more of them had like beats of like what we'd want to talk about and the things we'd want to like um, you know make fun of the satire we'd want to get to because at the end of the day we didn't want it just to be like silly comedy. It, it was satire. It was supposed to be like making fun of a certain thing, having commentary about something, and that's what it became. So we would have. We'd, we'd think of these ideas and how to like break them down into like the social commentary or the psychology behind it. And we knew that part of the, the greatness of it was the improv to it. So then we would just kind of like, here's some questions and here a couple jokes, but then Guillaume would just like ask me some things and I would answer them and make some jokes. And then sometimes we'd crack up and do it again. Other times he'd feed me a line. Other times I'd be like, Oh wait, I got a good one. Like ask me this question. So we just kind of did it. And it was amazing because you like you can't recreate that improv yeah. but at the same time sometimes we sit down and film for two hours and be like this isn't working like i'm just not feeling it today like this isn't coming together and we'd have to scrap it like a two hour waste and i have to shoot again well i, f I feel like as someone who has a, a comedic uh personality when you write a lot of times like you have this expectation of how funny it should be mm -hmm. and you feel like it like you're missing the mark but for 98 percent of the other people like out there that are watching something who doesn't have this like comedic brain they think it's like the most hilarious thing in the world you're like none of this is shit this is shit yeah. and I, I i guess i always just kept it to my own standard of what i think is funny i was like if it's not if i don't feel like if instinctually i'm like this isn't working i'll, I'll scrap it i don't care i'll scrap a whole video if i don't if i'm not feeling it that's like something i stick to i'm like i will not put something out that i'm not proud of yeah yeah and how how far into your when you started making the dom videos when was your first time getting recognized out in the world I remember it was at a bagel shop in, um, obviously, yeah, obviously it was a bagel <laughs> shop. Um, in, in the Upper East Side, it was like, it was, so it had to have been, so this was the first viral video was October, 2010. This had to have been maybe March, uh, 2011. And I was standing in line waiting to get my bagel. And this girl came up to me and was like, are you 
that guy from the and I was from like, thing? yeah, I was like, sh- like pretty nervous because I was like, well, what, what's happening right now? And like, I didn't expect it to be a, a girl of all people, like, because it's a, a bro heavy thing. Yeah, the Dom is Eddie Verse stuff had a little bit more um, female demographic, mainly because of our Dom versus Drunk Girls video, where we yes, just, you know, roasted girls getting <laughs> drunk. Um, but yeah, that was that was the first one, and I was like. Like, you know, there's yeah. some girl out there that doesn't know that she was the first person yeah. to recognize you out in the world. Yeah. And it's funny that like, I don't know how many, I wonder how many people, do you remember the first person that recognized you? No. Yeah. I, I don't know why I just like remembered that so much, but it's like weird. Eagle shots. Yeah. It's wild. And then your, then your whole internet career started exploding and you yeah. kept making videos. Why did you go like, you're a, you're a man of a lot of start, stop, change, Yep. You know, things for better, or for worse. Yeah. A lot yeah. of ebb and flow, if yep. you will. Yeah. Why did you go from Dom Mazzetti to bro science? I think um, that was 10 years ago. Yeah, it's 10. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple of things was like. I had been working out for a while at that point. I started working out um, freshman year of college. So I was like, really? And this is how big you are. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> not very, not very good at it. <laughs> I see, science, I see people bro. that work out for three years that are way bigger than you, bro. Your, fuck, your routine sucks. I know. <laughs> I need some bro science in my life. But I was like really into it in, in college and would like do the whole like, I, like I was a personal trainer for a bit to like make ends meet. And then I just like was seeing this wave of fitness, like people getting into it and getting more popular. And bodybuilding.com was a big thing then. And they'd have all these tutorial videos. And we were like, it'd be a funny idea to make, parody videos of like how to work out but like not just like making fun of this guy doing like silly exercises it's like how to actually go to the gym like there's plenty of people who tell you how to do an exercise yeah. and someone will tell you how to do the exact opposite and why it's right it's like we we wanted to do something where it was just talking about the world of the gym in general all the things that people didn't really talk about but everybody thought I was like oh, this would be a cool idea and it also came at a time when like you know you we were making videos like pretty much every week for Dom verse and it just kind of, you get burnt out a little bit. You're kind of like, I, I don't, it's so joke heavy and it's so like well, so many topics. How long did you make Dom videos before switching to bro science? Two years. Oh damn. Yeah. Okay. So, and it just felt like we were going like over every topic under the sun cause it was so broad, which is good because you can choose from anything, but because it's so broad, you don't know where to go with it. Sometimes you don't have like a niche of the type. Right. It's interesting. You'd, you'd be like, yeah, we went from being able to make Dom verse anything in the world and we ran out of ideas. So let me go to one specific only yeah. fitness. And it works because we, you can, within that, you can get really specific and that helped the content last longer. Now, 10 years later, I have the reverse, which is like, I'm, I'm out of things to talk about. Right. But you know, it was a, a mix of like, uh, you had said, I, you know, I kind of stop, start things. Like a, a lot of it goes with like what I'm passionate about and what I have to say and, because that's going to be the product at the end of the day. And if I'm sort of like losing my passion for it, it's like, it's time for something new. It's time to you know evolve and recreate. So bro science was that, and it was kind of scary to start something new and it worked immediately. It was awesome. I didn't realize until today when I was doing a little deep dive, I just, for, for some reason, I just assumed you changed the Don Mazzetti channel into bro science. I didn't know you started like a whole new no. thing. When was the, like, did you give, I guess maybe back then it wasn't like necessary to do so, but did you ever like, Hey guys, I'm no longer making videos or did, like you just like Dom versus something. Look, and then there, people are still waiting for that next video. They're like, I'm not he wasn't uploaded that, in a while. I'm not saying I do these things properly, <laughs> but like the channel had like 400,000 subscribers. And once bro science started taking off, we just stopped making videos. Just left it there. To this day, it was like the last one was like Dom versus Vine. I know. Ironic. And that was <laughs> yeah. w- when I looked, when I was looking yeah. it up, I was like, wait, this can't be right. It says last upload nine years ago. I was like, no, he just uploaded the other day. I was like, yeah, no, a d- totally different channel. And like, you know, we just put all our focus into that. But I think it also comes down to like at this time, YouTube was still a totally different landscape. Nobody took it seriously, right? Like yeah. nobody looked at YouTubers and was like, these people are making money. People are like, you yeah. fucking loser. Right. Get a job. Um, and we didn't take it seriously. Like this was still for many years, a a launching pad to get to traditional Hollywood. Yeah. That was the goal. So we never saw it as a home. Like, Oh, this, this is what, you know, we're going to live here and we're going to make the most of it. Um, 
which looking back, like I wish the timing worked out a little bit better where like we did, but it, it was all the goal was just to be in Hollywood was still to like sell a TV show. And that's what we were doing in the background as we were making all these bro science videos. So instead of like keeping up two channels and being like, now we're just kind of like keeping ourselves on the internet at a time when, you know, it really wasn't making all that much money or it didn't have as much opportunity. It seemed, um, you know, people in traditional Hollywood would look at you and be like, YouTuber, like fuck out of here. Yeah. They still kind of do that now, but like everyone's just going back to the internet. So, um, yeah, you know, we, we just left the channel. How do you, <laughs> many channels you've <laughs> yeah. left, we're only, we're going to dive into them. Yeah. Like, how do you think your mindset has changed? Cause as someone who as I've been making videos for 10 years, not yeah. quite as long as you, um, probably more consistently than you. Anyone could be the more consistent. <laughs> yeah. okay, <man>. it's like <laughs> but like my ideology and how I created content back then when it wasn't like I, I probably made videos for two, three years before I really made any money. Like I'd say maybe you'd make 200 bucks or right. yeah. 50 bucks worth of sponsorships or something. But like you were just making content because you love doing it. Whereas now it's a business, mm -hmm. right? Like how's your mind changed of like m making videos back then and then making videos now to support a livelihood? It's, it's a tough one, especially with bro science now where it's like, I've, I've gone through the, the different versions of it where it's like, all right, we got pretty close to making something in Hollywood. Realize that like, maybe this isn't really right for me. You know, maybe YouTube was the home all along and then you go back to it and then you, I, I just kind of like, yeah, you, you, it, it becomes a job and it becomes something you have to do. And so you lose a little bit of that, like joy and that passion and that sucks, it sucks out of you because like, I don't, that's not why I didn't get into it to be famous. I yeah. didn't get into it for money. Like I did it cause I wanted to live whatever life I, I wanted. So at the time it was like, I want to make comedy videos. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to find a way to support myself doing it. And I just kind of like followed that sort of feeling. And then, you know, it, responsibilities and bills and a certain lifestyle you want to maintain come along with it. So you do have to start treating it like a job and use and a business. And at some point it comes with being like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of falling out of love with it. And at that point for me, I'm like, okay, then it's time for something new. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like establish a way to like still keep a foundation of income underneath it and still like, not just what I did with the first channel, abandon it entirely, like still have something that you can, um, you know, that you can build from and scale. And like, that's currently where, I, where I'm at with bro science. It definitely messes with your head too, because you know how you like, you, you made videos, I made videos to just put out entertainment, whatever mine was less entertainment back then. It was more just, I can deadlift a lot of weight or something like, yeah. but I was some form of value people were given, but then it was like, you upload a video and there wasn't, there wasn't of like, how did this video, video perform? Oh my gosh, this video performed worse than the other ones. You just put it out and they just did what they did. Mm -hmm. And now it's, if this video doesn't do X, it was trash. Oh my God, we got to change the title. We got to change the thumbnail. Yep. All this was, this bombed waste of our time. Like, does that mess with your head? Like the, the whole metrics nowadays? Um, how about the, the YouTube rating system? Trash. One out of 10, 10 out of 10. Oh yeah, that's, that now does. Um, I, not, not really, because fortunately... Pretty much every video I put out, like, <laughs> fucking banged. <laughs> so, like, I never really worried about it. It was only like, oh, this one's crushing it. This one's extra crushing it. <laughs> yeah. They just all killed it. And, like, that was part of my philosophy was, like, I'm just going to make good videos. I don't want to do it every week and then just water it down or just also get people used to that. Like, I think one of the things that people forget now with how much we're trying to chase the algorithm uh, is that there's still like an organic algorithm of what people find interesting and how yeah. people like view things. And I think like a video every week sometimes makes you skip videos. You're like, Oh, uh, uh whatever. There's going to be another one next week. Right. And if it doesn't really grab you, then like there's another one next week and there's another one after week after that. Now I'm not saying don't upload for three months. Like I do sometimes, but like when it comes out, you got to watch it. You don't know when the next one's coming and I'm only going to put stuff out that like, <laughs> that's a good strategy. Yeah, and it's like, you better watch yeah. it because you don't know when you're going to get <laughs> yeah, another one. Exactly. And I also, but it, mainly it's like, I only put stuff out that I'm like, yeah, this is going to be good. Like this is going to be not just because I have to at this very moment. And then it does kind of become like in some ways you have to, cause you got to pay your bills, but you can choose a little bit. Yeah. You'll be like, I'm, I, you know, I got brand sponsors, so I'm going to make this video, but 
if I had to make, if I was still doing one every single week at some point, like it would drive me insane. Like it, the, the quality would degrade, the channel wouldn't have lasted as long. It wouldn't have been as good. And I don't think all the videos would have just like crushed. And so I kept my consistency, not in my upload schedule, which is, you know, famously a major joke in the channel, but like in just how the videos perform. So now as like things are changing and I'm doing less with the channel, like, yeah, the, the rating system, you're like, oh, where is it on here? Yeah. And I'm like, Get the fuck out of here. Like, I don't want to see this. I didn't see this back in the I day. I mean, yeah. you're one of the few that has been uploading for, I'd say once you upload for over six, seven years, I mean, that is a long fucking time to upload yeah. um, as consistent as, you know, you, you can be, but to still be pumping out the numbers that you're doing on a consistent basis and the content is, you know, a lot of times I'm a, a vlogger now, mm -hmm. right? Love it or hate it. Um, you get a lot of like, oh, this is the same content, the boring, whatever, where yours is relatively the same content every video. Mm -hmm. It's poking fun at, you know, this, doing bicep curls on everything. But like people seem to still just love the character and love you for like so long, which is just like admirable to like be able to maintain that level of fandom. Thanks, man. Yeah. Have, I mean, have you ever done like a, uh, like both of your personalities in one video? I've been thinking about it. It just like, like you talking to each yeah, other. Yeah. Um, for this, one of the last videos I did, I was doing an interview of like my 10 years on on bro science and I was considering interviewing myself for it, but it just became such a, like a time yeah. monster to take down. So I was like, uh, maybe, maybe when I end the channel, don't end the channel, dude. I'm, I'll just, okay. I'll just walk away from it. You're right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> I'll just leave it on one. There's video. no, I mean, cause, cause yeah. people will never know if you end the channel. Cause they'll just it'd be, it'd be like, it might be a year. It could be the be next 10, upload. You don't know. <laughs> New video yeah. eventually. Yeah. So, and yeah. you know, as you switch into bro science, I think, something really important that you need to tell the people is how much do you lift every day? I, no, no. I want to know your, your lifts. Oh, all of them. I want to know all of it. No, I just want your, your bench squat deadlift. I want to know your maxes. I've never really maxed out to be honest. That that's what someone who can't lift a lot of weight would say. I mean, do I look like a guy who just lifts a lot of weight? I'm a bro, man. I lift, <laughs> I lift a lot of weight a lot of times. <laughs> how, of weight. how much can Domazetti bench? Uh, the most I benched was probably 275 for free. I've never done a one rep. Like, I've never just been like, how much can I do? Like, one time. Seriously. Because oh. I was just like, I'm going to fucking hurt myself. And, and obviously, you don't train legs. I do. Yeah. Damn. But don't tell anybody that. And you're, you're, you're natural, right? Yeah. I can tell for sure. Yeah. There's no, <laughs> the veins are hiding. And not, <laughs> the pump isn't everlasting. Yeah. It's, how, well, it's why did you decide to stay natural? I didn't really have a desire to do steroids. Like, I mean... I, I want to be in as good a shape as I can be while still like maintaining the life I want to live, which is like, you know, part of the reason people are like, oh, you haven't made gains in 10 years. I'm like, I have, but I also like, that's not my main goal. Like if I have to restrict myself so much on the, my lifestyle or what I'm doing or how I'm enjoying it, then it's not really worth it for me. So I just kind of like kept this balance of like, let's see how far I can go with it. And like, I take it seriously, but it's, it's not my whole life. Yeah. And, I never really wanted to take on any of the side effects that came with steroids, even if I was able to mitigate them because I didn't see the reward for it in it for me. I was like, I don't really want that look like, sure. There's times I was like, yeah, I just want to be fucking jacked and ripped because I'm a, you know, gym bro with body dysmorphia, but I was never like drawn to be like, this is, this is what I want to do. Cause to me, it felt like it was really limiting. Like it just in the way I would look or like what You're my just life the guy with muscles. Right. And, and like, I don't know. It just was never something I was like, I, I, I want to do this. The desire to be that big and that cut wasn't as strong as my desire just to be like, I, I enjoy what I'm doing and, and how I'm living. And um, it's not to say there's times that I just get frustrated and be like, yeah, I, I wish I was, you know, for all the work I've put in doing a little bit, uh, you know, you said there's like, there's guys have been lifting for like three months who look better than me, but I'm like, yeah. I, I like how I look. Like I'm, I'm happy with my physique. And like, even now I'm, I'm learning new things that just like, work for me. And I'm like, I, I'm in the best shape that I've ever been in at 34. And, and I love it. And I like the way I lift, I like the way I look, I like my diet, my lifestyle. And I'm like, this to me is like the real success I'm going for instead of just like getting on juice and then later maybe regretting it. Yeah. Or like being stuck on this cycle of like figuring that out. I think some people, anyone who makes a comment that you, you've looked the same since X time, 
hasn't been lifting long enough to know that that's going to happen to them too. <laughs> yeah, right. Like it's some, come talk to me in ten years. Yeah, whether you you've hit a peak and you just completely fall off, like I don't know, man. Like it's, I I I've definitely just like got caught in complacency too, where you're just like you're doing the same sort of exercises, you fall out of love with fitness, and like you know it becomes a job. It became a job for me, and I didn't take it as seriously, but I would still go to the gym and enjoy it. But I wasn't as like goal oriented because it was just kind of like I do this for. I used to do this for fun. Now I do it for fun and for work and to be in shape and just like, it just became a lot. So you're just like, you get kind of get fall into these rhythms of it. And now, like, like I said earlier, like adding skateboarding back into my life, like helped alleviate some of the pressure of like being jacked and being and lifting is like the number one and only value in your life. And once it like becomes a little bit less like all encompassing, you don't, it's, it's not as much pressure on it. And then you don't take it as seriously or like, you you enjoy it again and when you take it less seriously you enjoy it again and then you kind of take it seriously again yeah. and you just like fall back in love with it and you're like oh this is enjoyable instead of just kind of like a, a process that gives you body dysmorphia do you have any specific fitness goals at the moment or are you just uh yeah i mean i i've i've been i've been really wanting to grow my leg and i've <laughs> I, like i, I feel like if they haven't talking, after this amount of time no i mean like they they've been just because of the way I'm built, like my weakest body part. And I've always trained legs, but there's always been like, you know, you just don't do it properly for a while. You got injuries and like different excuses or whatever. And I train them every three days. Like I, I love training legs and I, I feel like a total you know, traitor saying that, but I do. It's just, there's just like my, and you're like, why won't you fucking yeah, grow? Why, why won't you do it? But they've, they've grown significantly in the past year. I also had a, a groin hernia for like 10 years that I just fixed last year. So that was probably limiting some of my yeah. fitness for a while. You know, not being able to, to lift so much without my intestines poking through. But like I, I got that fixed last January and then my fitness has just been like I was skating, like everything's just kind of coming together. So like my goals are like I want to I want to see how kind of just kind of like how big I can get while still like staying relatively lean. And I'm yeah. like doing it and it's nice because like when I do photo shoots and video stuff, like I don't want to be in a bulk cycle where I'm like I can't take my shirt off and, you know, advertise clothing or shorts or whatever so i'm just like messing around with different things and i'm seeing what's working and yeah, that's, that's it would you say you're proud but never satisfied yeah yeah it's a good way to put it right yeah it keeps you moving man to be yeah. honest like with the leg growth dude i think it's just how we are <laughs> it's I, like, dude, we just gotta say i it, can man. squat five well i've seen it yeah, i've squat 500 yeah. pounds dude, and like <laughs> whenever i feel bad about my, whenever i feel bad about my legs i'm like this dude is strong as fuck and i'm like Come on, man. Like, what, what, what's going to take for us? Was that literally, a, were you about to say, like, whenever I feel bad about my legs, I just, just look, look at, at you. you. And I'm, I'm like, no, I'm like, look, <laughs> it's never going to happen for me. <laughs> like, this guy can deadlift 650, <laughs> but looks like that. Why, why, who fucking cares what you can lift then? Dude, you're, you're a phenomenon, man. It's crazy. <laughs> so with the whole transition into, like, the whole gym world, have you found the videos are significantly easier to make than your old concepts? Or you, you said you're kind of not running out they of ideas. Were, they were. Now they're very, very hard to make. Why do you think that is? Is that because the trends are always constantly changing? I mean, I'm running out of steam on it. Like I, I was doing the math on on this the other day and. I did like I figured out the average amount of jokes in a video and it's 50 a video and it was something like 8000 jokes. I've, yeah, you're giving people too many jokes. Yeah. And then I'm just like, it's it's tiresome to have to like think of new jokes for the same sort of topic in some way and most of the the jokes are like layered to the point where it's like yes it's about fitness but more so that it's about people in general and and psychology and just like human nature and different things like that so they're pretty deep to get into so it takes a lot to like think and it takes a lot of energy to like come up with the ideas and figure out a topic that i can trojan horse this bigger topic into with um is it all you now it is, yeah. Me and Gion stopped working together in 2017. Um, we're still close friends. We just went different ways, careers wise. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's just me, just writing. Shooting, I, bro, editing. when I watch your videos, like some of the shit that you say and do in these videos, I like to consider myself a funny person, like and have and say funny things and have funny thoughts. Some of the stuff you do is like next level. And I'm like, how in the world did this man think of this shit in the gym? Even as little as like, like the things you're able to do bicep curls on, like in their last one, when you're doing it like with the battle ropes and then you have like both of the, like 
Bro, bro, it, I, I don't do it long enough. You start to see the, the, <laughs> the, the dots, man. You start to read the matrix. <laughs> you did. What was it forever ago? You were doing like bicep curls on the fucking like hamstring curl or like the, there the was leg a video extension. Of ten, 10 machines you didn't know were for biceps. <laughs> and it was just like anything I could. I was curling uh, the bench like, um, but like the last one you were bet you, you were benching on a bench that was supported yeah. by two benches. Bro. Yeah. What the <laughs> was, fuck? Well, I was like trying not. I was doing a video on how to squat and I was trying not to squat the entire <laughs> the entire video. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, for me, comedy is just like making connections to things. Like I, I see that this is related to this and this to that. And I just can kind of see this, this pattern of, um, how to bring it from this idea to this and just knowing how to, I don't know, structure a sentence that elicits a certain feeling and that yeah. feeling here is, is laughter. And I just kind of know that if I change this word, this will happen. If I move this sentence around this way it will make more sense here, but I'm also protected from people canceling me. You know, like yeah. if, I, if you just say a certain thing a certain way, or you just know how to hedge yourself. And I take a lot of time really carefully writing it out. And then I'll, I'll say the script and then I'll improv. I feel like, I don't know if your character Dom could get canceled. Like, I feel like you could say some ridiculous far left, far right shit. And everyone just be like, it's, it's a, it, Made up character. Yeah. I mean, kind of. But I also think that like there, there people get canceled for a lot of, a lot of shit, right? Yes. A lot of dumb shit, a lot of things that they probably should be canceled for. But I think it kind of comes down to like the intent behind it, right? Yeah. Like I know what I'm trying to say. I know who I'm making fun of. I know what I'm making fun of. I know the message that's getting across in that joke. I know how to properly structure that joke. That, like, yeah, some people are going to get offended probably, but. Uh, it's it's not I, I firmly believe that this is the the right way to go about it and it's just being smart with your comedy and I think anyone who's like you can't joke about anything anymore these days is just being lazy it's yeah like you're just not good at your job like, you have to evolve with the right. times and it's like I know better than anybody that like it's a lot of touchy subjects but if you are good at your job if you know how to evolve with it you're really good at comedy you understand how to communicate an idea that's all it is at the end of the day it's communicating something and it's supposed to be funny and silly, but there's a message behind it. There's a point behind it. And if you know what that message is and you're like, and it's not awful, right? Like then you're, you're probably not going to say anything that's going to get you canceled. Like anyone can be offended by anything, but like, if you look into it, it's not going to be like, yo, this guy is like actually a racist or this guy is yeah. actually like a piece of shit. It's like you, you, you just do your job. Well. Have you ever had any sort of outlandish response to something you've done? Yeah, I'm sure some comments about different things, um, especially because it's a character. A lot of people um, don't understand it's satire. So sometimes it comes with like people being like, how are you giving that advice in the gym? People are going to hurt themselves, like <laughs> things like that. That's the type of comments? Something. Yeah, a lot of times um, when people don't understand it's a character, they just get really like annoyed by things. So not so much people being like offended, but more just like feeling like they need to speak up against it, like. This guy, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about or like just taking it too seriously and, yeah. and being like, dude, how do you not? Well, so with your like massive success you've had over the, the many, many years, it's obviously turned into something that you've been able to support your lifestyle and everything. Can you kind of like, how do you, how do you make your money? Mainly clothing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what are your streams of revenue? Uh, clothing ad sense on YouTube, much less, uh, brand deals. Um, I've got two clothing brands and then, uh, some other business projects and investments that I am launching in about a couple of weeks. What? Yeah. Yeah. Can you say what they are? It, this, this, this comes out in like three weeks. Yeah. It's, uh, I in, invested in a, in a company that, um, is making like protein gummy bears and they're, ama what? they're amazing. And the macros on them are incredible. It's like for a whole pack, which is like a good size and they're delicious. 18 grams of protein, like half a gram of fat and 22 grams of carbs. And they're good. They're, they're taste good. They're amazing. They're very good. Like I, a guy came up to me at the gym and talked about it and you know, he was like a startup and um, he asked if I wanted to get involved. And Wait, invest. is this the protein gummy bear brand I see on TikTok that like, it hasn't launched yet. Do they have a TikTok? Mm, I don't think they do. Hmm. There were, you, you might you either have competition because there's someone else that's doing the, the same yeah. thing or it's that company. Yeah. But either way, yeah. that, that's awesome, dude. Yeah. And what would you say is the most profitable out of all the things you do? Uh, bro science clothing. Even yeah. more than AdSense with your views? 
Oh yeah, AdSense is dog shit. What? Yeah, man. How I many mean, views a month are you getting? A couple million. And it's that. Dude, a lot of videos got demonetized for oh. you. Gotta remember that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Do they get demonetized on a regular basis? Uh, not some of them now. Like I kind of, I don't know how that recently they haven't. But I'm not also just not that consistent. With it. You know, like I, it's it's not something that I can uh, rely on for like a main source of income. And I I didn't even back in 2016 when it was paying out triple what it is now. It was just like at that point, clothing was always my main source of income. Thankfully, because in 2016 with the ad apocalypse overnight, you were making a third of what you were making the day before yeah. for no reason. Same amount of views, nothing to monetize. It just was paying a third. I was like, damn, if this was my main source of income, I'd be fucked because I'm at the whim of YouTube and, you know, whatever they decide to do with the algorithm or AdSense or whatever. Um, so I never, ever after that, like really relied on that as like, this is an actual main source of income for me. And so you, you started the clothing, the Dom merch, yeah. right? Um, which is a lot of like funny shit that, you know, it stems off of, you know, I, or it's like the shred Zeppelin, the Brodello yeah. mass pro shops. Do you have like a whole team behind it? Or is these like kind of, I say dumb in a nice way, like yeah. dumb concepts you come up with. That'll be funny. And like, it's just me They're coming up with the ideas. Yeah. I have a, the people, you know, running the, the clothing warehouse and film it and all yeah. that stuff. But the ideas are just me. And then I have like, some of them I'll design myself and others. I'll just like create um, like a rough, outline and give it to a designer and be like, Hey, do this and do that. But all the ideas are just me. Coming up with shit. And what about this, the supplements, the like NAR pump and all yeah. that shit was that, did you, have you found great success in that or in, in cause be, it's almost yeah. like a, a merch of supplements of the yeah. Dom, right? We actually just stopped doing the supplements in the, in the beginning. Like we saw success throughout, but yeah, it was just sort of like supplementing the clothing. Yeah. And it was like a nice thing to have and just super early to it. You know, like one of the first people to start like my own, like a, an, influencer or creator mm -hmm. starting their own supplement company because they started back in 2015 i think um but again like at this time everything was just sort of supplementing the main goal of getting somewhere else and then when you kind of go back to it um i'm like damn i got some like businesses to run now and i yeah. didn't know shit about running a business man i was a comedy writer like i'm i'm, I'm the funny guy i'm a funny guy like i don't know fucking anything about running a business so now i'm like back on youtube figuring out how to do it and um realizing that like YouTube and clothing and, and merchandise is like really the home for me. And I had this supplement company that existed within it and it was like successful, but like I was not really set up to like run it as a supplement company and kind of like my focus was in trying to figure out what the next moves were, were for me. And by the time I like started to figure them out, like a bunch of other supplement companies are popping up and they're like solely supplement companies and run as such and like you just can't really compete after a yeah. certain point. I'm like, this wasn't my, you know, my cash cow anyway. So it's just not really cost effective to keep investing in supplements when clothing is much cheaper to make and you don't have to buy such inventory and it doesn't go out of, you know. Yeah. And well, instead yeah. of like creating this like uh, hyper, like long-term thing with a supplement brand, the clothing is like new design, new design, new design, yeah. new design. It's always fresh. It's always fresh. Yeah. And with, with your, why did you, so you started this, the shell shell corp. Yep. Why, why did you want to start? I guess we'll call it a real clothing brand yeah. versus the Dom merch, which I'm, I'm assuming that it's a slower start than the Dom merch probably crushes. And this is like something like, a, is this like a new passion project or like, why do you want to create like a, a, cl like a clothing brand when the merch is doing so well? Um, again, it's about what excites me and what's, you know, what my passions are. Cause I know that like, I am, I am not from the start a businessman. Right? Yeah, like I am. A I agree with you. Right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, no, I, I'm sorry. no, no, no. I, I relate to you. I relate to yeah. you. That's what I meant to say. So it's like I, I am a creator. Like I, I, whatever it is that like, whatever value I have comes from creating something, and I, and I know that. And it's like when I am seeing that eventually, I, I have to stop creating bro science videos for just because I can't do it forever. I don't want to do it forever. And as Bro science exists. It's still, it, it's gotten to the point where like it can run on its own without YouTube videos and without like support directly from me, from the character. Yeah. But it's still, it still does rely on me making those YouTube videos, being in character, creating content around bro science, around Dom Mazzetti. And I'm currently working on, on ways of like separating the business from that and being something that's just like, money I earn in my sleep and kind of like check in with and just kind of be the face of passive like, income, yeah, dude, exactly. the trigger word in, instead of being like just cranking out YouTube videos to grow it or keep it alive. Um, 
you know, I saw, I saw down the field. I'm like, I can't keep doing this in this manner and I don't want to, but I'm not just going to shift entirely into business mode and just run it like a business. Cause like, I'm not the guy for that either. Like I got to hire somebody else for that and I can just like do what I do best. So in kind of these stop start projects, it's figuring out like what's next for me creatively and what's going to sustain me long term, what I can grow beyond myself, what I can grow beyond bro science. And I looked at what I like to do, what my interests were and what made me money. And it was clothing. Clothing is what made me money. And what my interests were is like in, in art, in designing, in fashion, in, and in media. And I wanted to create a clothing brand of clothing that I saw as, you know, personal expression, which is you know, things that I, I wanted to wear, a person I wanted to become. Like I wanted to create a style that I saw in my head of like, this is the type of clothing I want to wear. I want to look like this person. I want to like, I have this character in my head I want to be. And clothing is a way of doing that. And as like, I feel the same about like getting tattoos and stuff, it's like, I saw a lot of value in seeing clothing from that aspect and like what I can do with that. And I'm like, all right, but my, uh, you know, my success has come from making content. So I wanted to kind of, see advertising clothing uh, from a different angle where instead of just like it's media first and then you make clothing just to kind of support it. I wanted to make clothing first and then make media like to support it. But I wanted that media to exist and have value on its own where it's like an advertisement, unless it's like Super Bowl commercials, people aren't really going to like enjoy watching it. They're going to like tolerate it. And it's going to be like, Oh, this sold me a product, but I wanted to start making advertising that was like short films, like things that I was like excited to make, like art projects that would, um, people would watch for just that alone. And then it also sold you, sold you clothing. So it was just kind of doing the, the opposite of what I had done. And um, as soon as I started doing it, like I'd make the designs myself. So that's just like so satisfying creatively. Yeah. Um, the media I, I really enjoy. It's just like tapping into a different side of my creativity instead of just like humor and playing a character. and. I get to express different um, sides of me and, and share that, which is why I like entertaining. And, and I know it, it's, it's a profitable business and it's come with a lot of ups and downs and yeah. different things. As I, now I'm Clothing's just, a bitch, dude. Yeah, now that I'm not just printing on like, yep. you know, blanks. Like, oh, you're doing like, like, like a cut and sew? Everything is cut and sew. Every Headache single, level goes through the fucking roof, bro. Everything is cut and sew. And I'm so particular about how it fits and how it looks. Like I've, I've learned there's so many things that are like, so much time you know what the biggest great thing about how style has evolved now that the biggest thing is like oversized yeah it's like you can't fuck up the sizing as long as you just don't make it too small no see <laughs> the, I, I did the opposite man i was like i see oversizes in and i like that but i don't want to just make a big shirt yeah and i was like i spent a year designing a perfect t-shirt that was like it gave the oversized look but still flattered your body it was like the sleeves weren't belling out the body wasn't boxy it was like it needed to be just right where it didn't look like it was sticking to your skin but it also didn't look like a box. And I was like, this is, I, I know what sort of thing I'm going for and what feeling I'm going for, which I see the same as comedy. Like I know exactly the emotion or feeling I'm trying to get out of something. And I can create that in almost any medium when this is happens to be clothing. It's like, I want this to feel a certain way and I know how it looks and it feels when it goes on your body and how you feel wearing it. And I want to extract that from like the design of it. And so that's how I went into clothing and um, it's been cool been interesting i can tell you're passionate about it man it's cool to hear people who talk very passionately uh, passionate passionately about their business their craft and uh it's cool to see and with all the success that you've you've had and you know the money you've earned over the years you know what's uh what's some like what's the dumbest thing you've ever bought <laughs> oh i've got a lot of those <laughs> man i just do because you have an r8 right yeah and that's a passion like you love cars yeah right um, i mean i started a car youtube channel i want to talk about that briefly right after yeah. uh the dumbest thing i've ever bought um, do you have any fancy jewels no i i, I spend my money uh, now on just experiences production, yeah. experiences production experiences and at the time cars um i have my r8 which i've modified and but i haven't done anything to it in a while i had a mclaren before that which is probably one of the dumbest things i've ever bought i just like went into the showroom and i was like that one give me that one right there super like just did bought you, it did you lose your ass on it no really no i i paid for just about all of it in cash i was just like what am i doing but dom's doing well yeah, i was like it was yeah you know but it was the the most appreciating car you could buy at the well time. no that's what yeah. i'm saying like when you sold it did you like no, lose money on it no i made money on it what yeah um it, it just 
if I let it depreciate any further, then I'd be, you know, not looking good. But so that was one of them. I bought this, um, I bought this army truck. It's like, what? yeah, this giant, um, five, it, five ton, it weighs 25,000 pounds, but it, it's five ton. Cause that's like the load capacity or something, but it's this giant army truck from 1985. It's fucking I, Rockwell axles yeah, type it's, of shit. It's six wheels. It, yeah. it, each wheel is like this tall. Um, and I, I bought it in Northern Michigan cause I was making RPM videos at the time. And I was joking with a friend about how do we keep up with all these like ridiculous, you know, crazy videos, like guy driving a Bugatti as an Uber, things like that. And I was like, well, the only thing we can really do is like, you know, get an army truck and use it as an Uber or sorry, a tank, use it an Uber. And we're like, I think we can buy a tank. We looked into buying a tank. Did you, did you use the big ass army truck as an Uber? No, we, we, um, <laughs> that would have been some shit. So we find out we couldn't buy a tank. You can't drive, um, the treads on the road or whatever. So, but we did find these army trucks for sale, like military surplus. And they were like 10 grand. And I was like, for the truck. Yeah. Oh, like, That's a fucking I'm going to go, I'm going to go buy yeah, one, right? dude. So we find this one in Northern Michigan and it's just like, comes with this, you know, paperwork of this guy who bought it from military surplus and it's an old piece of shit. And we were like, I'm going to buy this and it's going to be, um, a marketing vehicle for an RPM. We're going to film the trip. I'm going to use it as like a pop-up shop for, you know, the clothing I'm going to sell on it. This will be a great investment. We get there, go to buy the thing. Guy teaches us how to drive it. And we had to drive the thing all the way back from Northern Michigan to LA and it broke down every fucking day, <laughs> every day. We, we lost the brake pressure going up the Rockies and we had to like fix it with tin foil and duct tape. And like, we were afraid we we're going to lose our brakes going down the hill. And it was just, it was a hilarious trip that we, we filmed. When, when you bought it, the guy's like, you're like, this will make it back to LA, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, sure. Warranty right. expires right when you drive it off a lot. Yeah, exactly. Though. So bought that, filmed the whole thing and then got back to LA and shortly after just like an RPM kind of fell apart and I didn't really do anything with the video, but also I wasn't able to register the truck in California. So it's just like sitting in a lot right now. So you still own it? I do. Fuck. Yeah. I, and it's just one of those things where it's like the headache of going through the red tape of like trying to register it out of state is like something that's not high on my priority list right now, but eventually I it's going to be a vintage truck and you're going to make a ton of money on it. It is day, vintage. Dude. It's a, it's from 1985. <laughs> it's just been vintage. So yeah. you didn't, you, you haven't, do you own any like Rolexes or fancy watches? Nope. So yeah. just cars is what you just spend cars, money on? Yeah, cars and just experiences. And I dumped a lot of money into NARPM, which is why one of the reasons I had to stop that and just the time strength. So NARPM, another YouTube channel that has, well, it, you now change it to your personal channel name. It was. Which is now changed, dead. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. it was my, my channel name or my, my name, Mike Tornabeni. And then it was NARPM and I changed it back to Mike Tornabeni. When I first saw, when you, I don't know how, I don't know how I saw that when you originally launched the channel. I don't know if you did a, you had to have done a promo on something to let people know. Cause yeah. I didn't, uh, I, I don't think I was like knowing about you on Instagram. I don't know, whatever. I, I, I was like, Oh shit, this is, this is the real Dom. Right. And I, first of all, that was the first time I'd ever seen your, you as your personality. And at first I was like, man, this guy's fucking cool. And then these videos are next level shit, man. Like you're in RPM videos, the production value the creative thought, because as someone who creates videos, I can tell when someone really like this, there's a lot of work that went into this fucking video and the thought that, and the shots and the scenes, like what was your idea for that channel and why is it no longer a thing? Cause uh, it's sick. So that, that kind of was part of the identity crisis of 2016 of, or 15 of like, I need to do something outside of Dom. And I was like, who am I? What's, what's my value entertainment wise outside of this character? And I was making good money with, um, bro science. And so I was like, I had this car that ended up breaking down. I was like, I'm gonna buy a new car. I'm gonna buy an Aston Martin. And I was like, I had started watching top gear recently just to like learn about cars. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna buy this car, but I don't want to be a poser. I want to learn about it. I want, cause I didn't really know anything about cars. I didn't grow up like, um, my dad wasn't really into cars. He, you know, I didn't like grow up fixing cars or driving cars or go-karting or anything. I didn't really know shit about him. I lived in New York city. I didn't have a car for yeah. like 10 years. Um, but when I bought this car, I was like, I don't want to be a guy who just pulls it up to valet and doesn't know anything about it. It's like, I want to learn how to drive it. And through the dealership I bought it from, they had, um, this thing where like, you can go out to this racetrack and they had professional drivers teach you driving drive experience. Thing. Yeah. And I went out there and, um, 
learn how to drive it. And me and my buddy Zach filmed it. And I was like, dude, this is awesome. But like also there's a cool idea for uh, a show behind this, which is like car culture in general is very exclusive. It's intimidating. It's like, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't, how do you get into it? Like as somebody like most people grow up in it, they just know like things about it. And I didn't know anything. And I was like, I'm trying to dive into this. It's like, it'd be a really cool angle to, um, you know, approach this subject from is like somebody who is just trying to learn how to enjoy something, right? Like I'm developing a new passion that's expensive, difficult, a lot of barriers to entry. How do you do this? Because like, I don't know how you enjoy car culture. Like, where do you race? Where do you go do this? How do you learn this stuff? And I was like, this would be a great idea of like fish out of water, like diving into it, learning and going along with this process of like me and my (laughs) idiot buddy, like just doing rad shit, but also like learning and inspiring along the way. And it became, you know, about this like journey of like pushing myself and facing my fears and like doing things I was uncomfortable doing, which is like, I don't like doing things I'm not good at. Like yeah. I don't like it. But you, now you're yeah. fucking great. Well, you, you can drive, bro. Yeah. Like you can. I learned how to drive. Yeah. And and film the whole thing, and and it became you know it, something I loved. And the way we filmed it from the start was like we had our buddy Nick who makes TV shows. Like he uh, he's he's a documentary producer. Yeah, because like, these these videos yeah. are not these are next level type of production yeah. value. And he's an editor. And I taught between him and and myself. Like we taught Zach how to edit and. We had this like little production crew, um, but we kind of fucked ourselves by having this like level of production so yep. early on. And it was just, again, for me, bad timing. Like we started it right before the ad apocalypse. Like we, the channel just started blowing up. Like we were, we had like, I had like 50,000 subscribers in the channel and I was getting like 250,000 views a video. Like it was crushing it. This You're was like, like, why the fuck aren't you subscribing? <laughs> they were, they were like, but they ended up subscribing. Yeah. Like everything was going really, really well. And we're like, oh, we're onto something. Let's just keep doing it. And then again, overnight, adpocalypse, algorithm change, our videos dropped like 30,000 views a video. And we're and like, it's like, you're putting so much time and money and effort. Right. And we're like, what the fuck happened? Like, so we're like, all right, well, we know about this algorithm now. Now we got to produce every week to like satisfy it. So we just got on this treadmill of like having to crank out these videos every single week to to fight this algorithm and it wasn't even enough. And all it did was like drain us of time and money Mm -hmm. and it didn't yield the results. And we didn't realize that like that was just the new normal now. Like your 30,000 views is great for such a small channel. But at the time it just was a change that no one, I wasn't really aware of. And you have such high expectations of how well, I mean, you're probably one of the few people that have four channels under their belts that like you don't haven't logged into in years that are far beyond what people are like aspiring to, even yeah. get to one day. And it just, I don't know, it kept a high standard of what I wanted to create, but it was also just like rough timing of being like, if I had known, if it was later or earlier, I would have been like, you wouldn't have burned so much time and money trying yeah. to fight this algorithm produce every week. Cause that YouTube was literally killing types of content. Like you could not keep up. And so certain types of content could no longer exist on that platform. And NARPM became one of them. Like I didn't have the, the money to keep putting into it. It wasn't, set up like the ad revenue wasn't there anymore and we didn't have like a business behind it like the merchandise yet and it just could not keep up with the 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 burn rate of what it costs to keep doing it and just everybody's time and if we had known that this was just the new landscape of youtube i would have just applied the same principles i did to bro science and been like all right let's just produce it every now and then and just like stretch it out a bit and see what we can do and um unfortunately we just kind of like ran out of time with it and you know um, I had to take a step back from it and we just kind of got involved in other things. And, you know, Zach started working at Hoonigan and Nick just always had a real job. So he, like, he was pretty unavailable and I had to like refocus on other things. Hoonigan is, uh, uh, what's it? What's the, the guy? Uh, yeah. Ken block. Ken That's block. his brand. He just yeah. passed away. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I know. Really sad. Yeah. He's super. Su- yeah. Wow. Yeah. It will. Dude, I'm still subscribed to all your channels to uh, hopefully there's going to be an upload one day. There are. There are. I'm me not and, unsubscribing. Me and Zach are actually have been talking. And I know I say this all the time about bringing an RPM back. And like it's it is my favorite thing to do. Yeah. It, and to hear people say that, too, with like how popular bro science is, people like RPM is my favorite thing you've ever done. I'm like, trust me, it is for me, too. Like, I want to figure out how to bring it back. It's just another it's not only another side of you, but it's just another level of production value and thought and it's like when I first watched cut the first couple of videos years ago, I was like, what the fuck? Like this is not only can this dude drive the cars, like these videos are not 
This isn't some dude like, hey, I'm gonna go drive the car today. This is a this is a show. Yeah. And so we want to figure out how to keep that in there. And it just with all of our other time constraints and trying to figure out like how to run it properly this time, like yeah. make it make money, like get investments. Like so we're just like we've we've learned a lot from our time off and we are we do really want to come back and start doing it again. And I think it like, you know, it took me figuring out like other businesses that I want to continue instead of just keep going back to the like well that is bro science is like Shell Corp is something that I could see, you know, being the merchandise arm of NARPM. Yeah. And also just like outside investment. And now that Zach has had this whole world of working with Hoonigan, he has all these connections and understands like how to you know, get financing and budgets. And we can finally probably pull this thing together. Uh, Cause man, I, I love making those videos and the yeah. adventures we did. And it was just cool to see people like inspired by it, man. Like, the things people would say about it. I was like, dude, this, I didn't expect this. This isn't really what, like how it started, but it was just like genuine, like sharing my experiences and like how driving a car was a metaphor for like all the scary shit you had to do in your life. You just want to go fast and turn left sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Well, dude, I, I'm uh, it's been really cool to hear your entire story. And as someone who's been watching your content, you know, for over a decade, it's like, an honor to sit down with you, man. And like someone who's in the space and you're like, it's cool to see like someone who's a true creative, like the comment you made about like, I, I create, I don't run business. I just like, I like, you know, or you're like, that's not my, where my expertise or my interest lies. And just, it's cool hearing inside the brain of, you know, someone you see from afar and then you see how their brain works. And uh, I'm super excited for everything you have coming up. It's like any like final, like what's next type of things you want to let the people know about um, protein gummies. Yeah, the protein gummies are coming next. We got a bro science video that comes along with that. Yes. <laughs> do, do you have? Do you have the next bro? Like, are are you ever like ahead? Uh, no. Like, it's the next bro science <laughs> video from the last one. Have you filmed it? No, I haven't even wrote it. <laughs> Man, it's it's something. It just it takes a lot of energy and time to write. So I have to sit down and think. I'm like, all right, this is I got to commit to this. And yeah, it's, it's distracting from my other businesses, but um, it I have some ideas, and I think one of the topics I want to like tackle that's like a topic of every video more or less is body dysmorphia. And yeah. I want to find a way to like really get into it. Um, Cause it's just like there it's, it's lightly underlying, like, like underscoring every video in some way, but I want to like really get after some things about body dysmorphia. Cause I was talking with a friend about it and we're like going into like where it came from and yeah. like the value you place on being Jack. And it all starts when like you were a shy kid with no confidence and no girls and the one thing that changed that was how jacked you got and that value you place on it like fucks with your head and i'm like i, I gotta find a way to talk about this because that's the root of everything good i've ever created is like when i have something to say on it there's there's gold there but i have to really start i gotta dig for these bro science well dude i'm excited to see the next video yeah. and hopefully you don't you know one day i guess i'll never know when the channel stops because i'll just be like no he's, he's He's just uploading He'll at some point. It's, yeah, it's a dad that walked out from milk. That's, it went out <laughs> You're coming back, right? Yeah, you got to keep them, you know, toxically attached. <laughs> yeah. Well, sick, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I'm going to put everything all, I'm going to put all of your YouTube channels in the description. Hold me accountable. All of the clothing. Um, I, he gave me a whole bunch of swag. So you guys are going to see me rock this. And um, yeah, man, but thank you so much. And uh, that will wrap up this show. Episode 34 with Mr. Dom Mazzetti, AKA Mike. Told the fucking copy. Torn a beanie. Oh, uh, no. No. Torn a bean? No. Torn a beanie. Torn a Benny. Fucking. Torn a Benny. Torn a Benny. Torn a Benny. Bop it a booby, dude. Yeah, that's exact. Torn a monkey, <laughs> monkey, torn a bop it a booby. Yeah. <laughs> With some fucking pasta? Yeah. Well, dude, thank you so much. Uh, new episode of the podcast every Monday. Yeah, please subscribe to his YouTube <laughs> channel. New episodes every week. Now you got to go to him if he doesn't deliver. <laughs> unlike, unlike him. Yeah, new episode, new, uh, new videos every... I like how it just cuts off sometimes. <laughs> I'm running out of lies <laughs> yeah. now, man. Like, I'm really, it's all catching up to me. <laughs> all right, dude. All right, man. Ugh. I had some, I, I was had some gunshots in. <laughs> Bang. Do you ever see anyone that, um, like, have, have you ever had, like, a true people trying to, like, rip off the Dom character? Oh, yeah. I, I, a lot of TikTokers.